Hello, everyone. We'll get started shortly here as soon as the Zoom platform lets everybody in. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Christy Sullivan. I'm the secretary of the American Society for Cellular and Computational Toxicology. And I am pleased to welcome you to this February webinar presented by ASCCT and the European Society for Toxicology in vitro. I want to, first of all, encourage you to visit both of our society's websites to learn more about the programs that we offer and consider becoming a member to help support these activities as well as our other activities. The uh, webinar is recorded, of course, and the recording will be posted on the ASCCT website a few days from now. In the webinar platform, you can ask questions of the presenters using the Q&A feature at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please do put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat because um, it's easier for us to kind of keep track of all the questions there. We also have enabled closed captions, which you can turn them on or off in the toolbar down at the bottom there. And we would welcome you to say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. Some quick announcements before we get started. First of all, the European uh, Society for Toxin Vitro's International Congress is going to be in Prague this year in June, and early bird registration ends April 11th. So please uh, go to their website and register. I know many of you are probably planning to attend. Our ASCCT annual meeting is going to be in late October this year, and it's going to be in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. We are open for session and CE continuing education proposals, as well as uh, regular abstract proposals. And you can see the deadlines there on your screen. Hope you will head to our website and uh, propose some sessions for the meeting. Finally, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is hosting a summer immersion on innovative approaches in science. This is um, meant for early career researchers um, to help them um, learn about ethical and effective science. And there are a number of speakers representing the US, Canada, and Europe from industry and academia, and it should be a, a very exciting program. So I encourage you to go find out about that. Next month in March, we have uh, two presenters, Alex Borel and Agnes Carmos talking about some of their work. Um, and uh, that webinar will be, as I said, March 20th. This, it will be, as this webinar is, it is uh, part of our ongoing award winners webinar series. So Alex and Agnes won some awards at the ASCCT annual meeting last year. And then as well in April, we have three presenters. Uh, who won awards either from ASCCT or ESTIV. So we hope you will go to the ASCCT website and register and find out about this excellent work. Uh, Victoria, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks. Let me get set up here. All right. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, excellent. Should be good to go. All right. Well, thank you. I'm Victoria Hall. I'm a senior biomedician at Innovative, where I work as a contractor supporting NYSEA. Uh, I like to thank ASCCT for giving me the opportunity to talk again about our work to um, curate exposure and use information to place chemical hazard in a larger real world context. I'd also, of course, like to thank Allison Martin for organizing this webinar and making this really smooth as possible. Yes. Take a second. There we go. All right. So Elena is a parsa 
hard act to follow, but I'm going to switch gears here, and I'm going to focus much more on the computational side of cellular and computational toxicology. So the driving force behind my presentation at ASCCT conference was um, that understanding how human populations interact with and are exposed to chemical sources is essential for kind of contextualizing chemical hazard and understanding chemical risk. And what I mean by that is kind of shown in this um, image that I pulled from John Wamba and Kristen Isaacs at the ExpoPass group on the right side of the page here, where it's not just hazard alone or exposure alone that is going to help you prioritize what chemicals you investigate further when looking at risk, but is the intersection of both. As you can have a chemical that is very hazardous but has low exposure and thus might be low risk, or alternatively a chemical that has high exposure and low hazard, which is also low risk. It is when you have a chemical that is both high hazard and high exposure where you might want to investigate further, especially if you have a large list of chemicals and you're trying to narrow it down. The issue here is that uh, we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of chemicals all the time, right, when we're doing these kinds of analyses. And many of these chemicals lack measured estimates of human exposure. They lack, they lack um, experimental evidence. There's a lot of data gaps here. We don't often know how these chemicals are used. And so new approach methodologies like high throughput exposure simulations and structure-based chemical use models can help inform those exposure scenarios for data for chemicals. But the results of these models can be very high throughput. There can be a lot of data. It can be very difficult to navigate, especially for those who are unfamiliar with computational methods. And so at NYCEDEM, we have a tool called the Integrated Chemical Environment, or ICE, which if you're not familiar with, is an open access resource that provides access to toxicologically relevant data and different computational tools. And this includes things such as physiologically based pharmacokinetic models and in vivo in vitro extrapolation and being able to explore concentration response curves from high frequency screening data. Up until this previous year, what we did not have in ICE were these estimates of exposure that would allow us to look at that intersection of hazard and exposure. And so in 2023, we integrated exposure predictions from the Environmental Protection Agency's systematic empirical evaluation of models. And we brought in functional use categories from EPA's chemical, or chemical and product database into ICE. And so if you want to explore ICE, you can look at this QR code here. But the curation process and how we integrated these, I will be focusing on for this talk. So when I say we pulled data from um, scene three, or that systematic empirical evaluation of models, that comes from the ExoCAS group at EPA Center for Computational Toxicology and Exposure. You can read more about this model if you would like to in more detail at uh, Caroline Ring's paper who developed this model, it's really fantastic. But the model has three different inputs. Oh, there we go. So the first input that goes into the scene three meta model is use information. So if you're going to be estimating exposure, it's important to know how is a chemical used? What pathways are going to be relevant when you are looking at exposure? What pathways can we expect humans to interact with the chemical? And the databases that are fed into the scene three model include things such as um, the consumer or chemical and product database or chemical data reporting for EPA. The second input that goes into the scene meta model are high throughput exposure models. So there are 13 forward predicting exposure models um, that are read through. Which ones are relevant is going to be determined by that use information before, because some pathways are more relevant to certain exposure models, like um, consumer or dietary or far field pesticide sources. The third data source that feeds into the exposure pathways is um, biomonitoring data from the NHANES, or National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And in this NHANES survey, they take these um, fluids such as serum and urine, they look at concentrations of various chemicals within those and use a reverse dosimetry model to estimate exposure to parent chemicals. And through kind of a meet in the middle approach, they weight the predictions from those high throughput exposure models and that reverse dosimetry biomonitoring data. And they generate a population level prediction of median intake rate in milligram per kilogram per day. And so from that model here at NYCEDEM, we pulled down predictions for over 600,000 chemicals from EPA's GitHub page in November of 2022. From that GitHub page, we pulled down predictions for the 5th, 50th, and 95th percentile of exposure in milligrams per kilograms per day, and again, on a population basis. To ensure that we have highly curated data and high confidence data, we then limited the data set to about 480,000 chemicals that were in the model's domain of applicability. 
those chemicals and the relative rank of those chemicals can be seen below with the median estimate being given in the blue dots and the error bar is given in the light blue with the error bars representing that fifth and 95th percentile of exposure. One thing I want to highlight that I'll revisit in a little bit is that even though these models are exceptional, the Exocast team is top notch, these are amazing models, there's still a lot of uncertainty here, right? When you look at that 95th percentile compared to the fifth percentile, even for one chemical, there's a lot of range, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a magnitude of difference between those estimates. So we have mentioned, or what we wanted to focus on again is not just providing access to this data, but allowing you to get the, uh, the ratio of that high level of hazard versus this exposure rate. And so in order to do that, if you would like to access this, if you would like to generate your own ratios, you can do so through the in vitro to in vivo extrapolation tool that we have in ICE. And so then this IVIV tool, you get this EAD, which is um, equivalent administered dose, which puts that in vitro estimate to an in vivo, in vivo context. And in doing so, you can kind of estimate chemical hazard. And then we have an overlay option that allows you to take exposure predictions seen here in orange and plot them next to that EAD so you can generate your own ratios. And again, if you want to do that on your own, if you want to run this, I'm not going to go into ICE super in depth right now because that's outside of the scope of what I'm discussing, but you can visit IVIVE on the tool. So one of the really useful things about the scene three model is that it doesn't just predict exposure in milligrams per kilograms per day. It also helps predict you to predict um, exposure pathways. Because again, the exposure pathway is often not known. We typically don't know how all these chemicals are used. And so scene three predicts pathway of exposure through chemical structure based and property based machine learning model. So it takes that use information from databases like CPDOT and um, chemical data reporting, it builds a training set, and then it predicts these various pathways. It predicts um, four different pathways. There is the consumer pathway, the dietary pathway, the far field pesticide pathway, and the far field industrial pathway. And which one of those pathways is used is going to determine what high frequent exposure model it runs through. So for the approximately 480,000 chemicals that we have these exposure predictions for in ICE, we also pulled the pathway predictions from scene three. And so for these predictions from scene three, we created our own near field and far field annotations based on that predicted pathway. There are things like uh, near field, far field and dietary, we have far field dietary, et cetera. But I wanna point out that even with these predictions, even with these random forest models, even with the phenomenal work done to generate these predictions, a lot of chemicals are still unknown. And that's not because there's anything necessarily wrong with the model, the model works really well. It's just the fact that we don't often know how chemicals are used. And if you want to directly access any of these exposure predictions to play around with them yourselves, if you want to look at any of these specific pathways, you can do so through the ICE dataset page. Uh, QR code is provided here, which when the slide deck is passed around, you can use. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of uncertainty in our exposure predictions. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns in the exposure predictions that are just due to the fact that chemical use is typically not known, exposure pathways typically not known. And so what we are working to do is build up ICE not just as a resource for you to access some of these exposure predictions, but to also get an idea of what chemical use might be. To use it as a resource through which you can visit to get all this information in one place. So when I say chemical use categories, what I mean is the various ways in which a chemical can be used. That's going to explain things such as what sectors a chemical is used in. Is it industrial, is it agricultural, is it pharmaceutical? What role does a chemical play within a product? Why was it added in the first place? What products can, can, or can a chemical be found in? Do you think it's gonna be in a in hand cream or in a face wash or things like that? And by curating these categories and by providing access to these categories and looking through them, it can help inform the pathway for these various exposure products. So in the integrated chemical environment, our chemical use categories right now are derived from CPDEP or the Chemical and Products Database developed by EPA. Um, we currently use version three, which was developed in 2021. We're looking at uh, eventually integrating the ChemExpo release that EPA has, which is super cool. I highly recommend looking into that too. But this is a document-based um, database that has manufacturer-based documents, um, MSDS sheets, things like that, that 
that provide evidence of where chemicals can be used, how they're expected to be used. So the first type of chemical use that we have in ice is what's known as curated product use categories. So if you've used ice previously, you might know that these were once called uh, consumer use categories and we've been rebranded a little bit so we can be truer to the source material. But curated product use categories are derived from EPA's product use categories as developed by Kristen Ivers. And so curated product use categories describe the consumer products a chemical may be found in. Uh, this is useful in determining things like chemical composition, to figure out how much of a chemical is in a product because you might have a different percentage of a chemical in a uh, sealant versus like a pesticide or something like that. Um, you can also determine relative exposure frequency. How often are people acting with certain products? You can also determine the route of exposure. So what pathways, how do we think that the product is getting to the person? How is it being integrated into the body? And these uh, curated product use categories right now in ICE are accessible through the ICE chemical, chemical characterization tool. I'm not going to focus too much on the curation process here because this was done a few years ago and is not part of the more recent pushes, but we have uses for over 300 categories for nearly 5,000 chemicals. And if you go to the ICE chemical characterization tool, there are going to be bubble plots that show the hierarchical structure and relative abundance of categories and summary tables that provide breakdowns by category and by chemical. So if you input a chemical list of interests, you're going to be able to see if that information is here for you, what the breakdown is, what the most abundant uses are, what chemicals have the most uses, et cetera. So you'll notice that with those exposure predictions, we have over 480,000 compared to CPDAT, where we only know about 5,000 chemicals and how they are used. And so product use isn't often known or reported or easy to find in these MSDS sheets or these manufacturing documents. And so when you have that gap, you have to start looking at other uses. You have to start thinking about what's other information I can use to either inform this or backtrack or fill in this information in these data gaps. And one of those uses is functional use. And so functional use is the role a chemical plays within a product. And so in our latest release of ICE, we pulled two types of functional use data from CPDAP. So the first type of functional use is a reported functional use that is harmonized to Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD categories. So OECD has a list of 107 functional use categories. And you can go through the different reported uses as reported in manufacturer documents and harmonize it to make sure that on a global scale or on an international scale, things um, line up or align or can be more easily applied. The second type of functional use that we pulled down are predicted functional uses. And these functional uses are predicted from quantitative structure use relationship models developed by Catherine Phillips over at EPI. And these quantitative structure use relationship models are property-based and structure-based models that are going to predict the role a chemical might play based on those structures. And so even though this isn't reported and it might not necessarily be as high confidence, and silico methods like this can help fill in some of those data gaps. And as part of the curation process here, we um, were able to get reported functional use for about 7,500 chemicals that were already harmonized to OECD categories within CPDAT. So this is already in CPDAT. We pulled those down, utilized those. After looking at the OECD document and looking at the reported functional uses, we were then able to additionally harmonize at NICEDAM another 2,000 chemicals to kind of best represent the data, get more data, make sure we have as much reported information as possible. And so at the end of this harmonization process, we have a functional use data set in ICE that has 77 OECD uses for approximately 9,000 chemicals. And on the right here, I just included a super quick histogram of some of the most abundant, or abundant uses like fragrant, flavoring and nutrient, softener and conditioner, et cetera. So you can see the relative breakdown of uses in ICE. For predicted functional use, um, the functional use predictions were already with or um, limited to chemicals that were in the QSER model's applicability domain. So that means that we didn't have to do that additional step. What we did do to curate the data further was we limited the probability of prediction to at least 80% to ensure high confidence in results. And so that functional use data set in ICE has 37 predicted functional uses for approximately 192,000 chemicals. So you can see that by bringing in these in silico methods, by bringing in these, these new approach methodologies and these high throughput methods, we're able to greatly increase the space through which we can represent this data. 
And some of the most abundant uses that you can see here in ice are things like fragrance, antimicrobial, color, and so on and so forth. So if you want to access the functionally used data set, you can do so through um, visualizing it in the ICE chemical characterization tool. You can feed in chemical queries. And in those chemical queries, we have these heat maps that are going to show you the relative representation of that OECD functional use and predicted functional use. And on these heat maps, you're going to see the number of substances that have a given type of functional use. And the color of the style is going to respond to or correspond to whatever chemical list you have in the chemical query. So if you want to compare the uses of two chemical lists, or you just want to do one, it's up to the user. And if you want to download these curated functional use categories that we have, you can do so through the ICE datasets page as well. This is going to be both the OECD use and the predicted use. And through this endpoint, you're going to be able to see um, which one is which if you're trying to just go with the uh, reported versus you're OK with the predictions because you're trying to increase that kind of space. So another thing that I talked about in my poster back in the conference was just a sneak peek of some of the things that we are working on that I think will help benefit the chemical characterization, help give us a better idea, and help focus investigations when we're looking at exposure and chemical use, is um, classifier. So classifier is a chemical taxonomy that is uh, developed by the Wishart Research Group. It is an automated structure-based hierarchical taxonomy that has up to 11 levels of classification and approximately 4,000 classifications across all levels of the hierarchy. So this is a really cool tool. They have batch search, API, things like that to investigate. Um, but it goes from kingdom, superclass, class, subclass, with then additional classes. And so the reason I think bringing in a chemical taxonomy of some sort into ICE would be useful is because I think we can help link it to certain chemical use categories within ICE and we can kind of figure out what chemical classes and structures are most abundant for certain uses or for high or low exposure chemicals. So you can get an idea of maybe what chemical structure is most abundant in a biocide or what chemical classes are most abundant in um, an abrasive or maybe your high, or your, your high exposure chemicals all share this one chemical taxonomy. And by doing so, it can help focus either follow-up investigations or it can aid in the selection of alternative chemicals. And so as part of this exploratory process, one of the things that we were looking at is we conducted a case study of 100 chemicals within the OECD functional use of biocides. And we just ran it through the classifier case study just to see what that output would look like. And so we ran those biocides through, we mapped them to 88 chemicals within the classifier kingdom of organic compounds. And we were able to see that most of those 80 or most of those chemicals that we ran through that were organic compounds are mapped to things like benzene and substituted derivatives, whereas fewer are mapped to things like um, desticides and desticides. And we're playing around with various visualization methods so that way if you ever visit the ICE tool, their chemical characterization tool, and you don't feel like looking at a table, you can see either some kind of quick hierarchical structure or some kind of idea of what taxonomies are most represented in your, your query. And with that, I will summarize by saying that in our continuing efforts to provide high confidence, high quality, relevant, toxicologically relevant data, we curated exposure predictions from EPAC3 model and function use data from EPACP dat in 2023. Um, with the inclusion of these data, users will be able to better explore how human populations may interact with chemicals and their potential levels of exposure. And the addition of these new data types in ICE facilitates the potential addition of new data sources, exposure models, and types of use. So things like maybe occupational exposure models, which are excluded from same theory at the moment, um, models that have demographic or cohort-specific information, other types of uses like sector, sectors of use. So if anybody has any suggestions for data types or use types or exposure sources that they would like to see in ICE, please let me know. We would love to know what people are interested in, what people are looking at, and what they would find the most useful. And with that, I will wrap up by thanking the Nicene group. It's a phenomenal group of scientists. We all re work really hard on things like this, and I'm lucky to work with them. I'd also like to thank EPA for generating all these really awesome data sources that we're able to go through and curate and integrate into ICE. Uh, and if you have any follow-up suggestions or comments, you can email me at my email here, or you can 
contact ICE if you would like to know more about our website, know more about how to navigate it and get some of these specific data sets. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Victoria. That was a really informative presentation. I, um, ICE is such a voluminous tool. There's so many different yes. things people can do with it. Uh, I always like to see little bits and pieces of what they what you have in there. Um, we have a couple of questions. So again, um, we have uh, about 10 minutes. So go ahead and add any questions you have into, uh, into the Q&A and we'll ask them of Victoria. Uh, we'll get started now. One of them is, uh, well, it, it asks how you include high production volume versus low production volume, but I'll just ask even, is production volume part of the, the exposure model? Mm -hmm. Or is that taken account in ICE separately? Um, so that is a very good question. I do want to point out it is EPA's model. I'm not, I'm not going to claim that one. So just make sure that they get full credit. Expo Pass team does. But Within their 13 high throughput exposure models, not all of them are going to take production volume into account, but I believe the ones that are relevant to industrial pathways do through the chemical data reporting um, database. So I believe that they do to some extent where available, where applicable. I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that they do. Um, within ICE itself, know that information is not provided anywhere. I think we're looking at getting that integrated to some extent. But right now, my answer is I'm pretty sure it is through the meta model. I can't say that with 100% certainty, but where relevant, I believe it's considered. Okay, great. Um, a question from me, actually, I was wondering as you were talking through, you know, some of the uncertainty that's involved in um, exposure modeling. I'm wondering if ICE has the possibility either for people on their own to maybe add in more of their own data or if people want to send you, maybe they they have data <laughs> that they could share. What, what are some opportunities there? Yeah, absolutely. We are always on the lookout for more data. Um, if you have data sources that you would like to integrate or you would like to see integrated, whether they're yours or they're just suggestions or something that public that's already publicly available, feel free to email us at this contact email here and we can discuss it with the nice item team, see what they're interested in and integrate that. Um, we are starting to look out to some other sources other than just using CP dot and scene three, but it's a process and it takes a while to curate and make sure that everything aligns. So if folks have suggestions, we'd be more than happy to hear. It. Please let us know. Great. Another question in the Q&A uh, is um, they're wondering if you have considered or maybe there's the end point is already there. They're asking about neurotoxicity information. Uh, neurotoxicity. Another very good question. Right now, in terms of things like ex exposure, we don't really have a neurotoxicity pathway considered. I know there is a lot of um, interest in doing so. Um, so right now, no. But if you have suggestions again, please let us know. Okay. Um, another person asks, have you thought about how artificial intelligence may be used to develop predictions from the data sets? Um, I mean, of course we've thought about it, you know, that's, it's hard not to, um, I think to me, sometimes the struggle is a lot of these are already predictions and building additional predictions using an input of prediction is challenging. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of what we're trying to focus on right now, maybe more so is either getting cohort specific estimates or just getting more training data, farming more training data, getting more concrete experimental data to feed into these before we kind of focus more on that aspect of it. Yeah. Okay. 
Another question is, uh, does the IV IVE tool work only with IC or EC50 values, or can you also use point of departure? For example, um, you obtain using benchmark dose modeling. Mm -hmm. So right now, the default for IV IVE, uh, we run it using the ToxPass and Tox21 data. So it uses um, ACC and AC50 in order to run through. So if you just run a chemical list right now, those are the two options provided to you to use ACC and AC50. There is an option to upload custom data. I'm not sure how specific you can get with that endpoint other than ACC and AC50. I believe you can. But right now it just focuses on those on those two. Okay. Great. Well, um, that's all the questions I see. Um, I, I Just one more comment. I was really interested in kind of the end there where you were talking about the classifications yeah. um, in the, uh, of the different types of chemicals and linking those with the use categories could be really, really useful for trying to find safer alternatives that mm -hmm. function, right? As you highlighted. Yeah. It's a really interesting tool. Absolutely. It's super cool. There's so many uses to it. We've been trying to figure out different ways to integrate it since we've been working on curating that data. And yeah, I think the idea of finding potential green alternatives would be really awesome. Well, thanks, Victoria, for your really nice uh, presentation. Thanks to all of the viewers for all of your questions and your attention.